In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. I was so excited when I found out that this was the passage for this Sunday. Spiritual darkness is one of my great loves. It has defined some of the most painful periods of my life, and I have spent many years trying to understand it and make meaning from it. I've come to a place now where the winter solstice is my favorite holiday of the year, when the literal darkness calls me into quiet rest and reflection, and whether I find this reality welcome or not, I find myself more alone with my desire, feelings, and questions than at other times of the year. And so I feel a bit protective of my favorite holiday. It bothers me when people reduce this brilliant dark of solstice to a day to mark when the light is returning. I feel it does a disservice to my friend Darkness and her twin sisters, grief and desire. And so in this solstice Christmas New Year season, I wanted to find a way to share my theology of darkness with you. I have a short story that I wrote about four years ago. It's some creative writing that I hope comes across uh, or conveys what I think are the gifts of darkness are and the relationship between dark and light. So I invite you to sit back. I hope you have a cup of hot beverage, which is the best part of Zoom church, and take in a Sunday story time. Before the beginning, the earth was unformed and void with darkness over the surface of the deep. And this wild and tormented place knew no God. The last thing I remember is walking along the sandy shore at sunset. It was beautiful, and I couldn't help feeling that the sunlight dancing on the water was whispering to me to come closer. I wanted to feel the rays tickle my skin, feel the wind through my hair, to drink the colors and feel the liquid sunshine flowing through my veins. My whole body hummed as I took off my shoes and waded into the water, but there was a drop off. It was deeper and closer than I expected, and with one big wave, my feet were swept out from under me. There was nothing to grab onto, and I was pulled out into the open ocean, kicking hard, trying to come up for air. Now it's pitch black and freezing cold, my body's thrown against jagged rocks, and I grab on. I drag myself up just far enough to breathe, sputtering and choking on the briny water. In this awful dark, I desperately scan the blackness in every direction, trying to make out anything at all. Nothing. I see nothing, and panic rises in my throat like bile. My arms feel tight, and my hands start to cramp up. I have a sharp pain in my chest, and my stomach turns over. Gasping to catch my breath, I try to crawl along the rocks out of the reach of the waves, but I can't control my arms enough to get a firm grip. The water lashes at me, the rocks are razor sharp underneath me, and I let loose a wild scream sob full of every ounce of frustration, rage, and confusion that I possess. It doesn't do anything but make me angrier. I'm still in this ungodly place where no one can hear me and no one will ever find me. And so I realize there's no reason to hold back. I gather my fury and howl, not for anyone else to hear, but to feel the full weight of my own wrath, loneliness, and disappointment. I yell back at the roaring wind and waves and I feel the strength of my limbs again. I finally pull myself up out of the surf and I collapse. I have no idea how long I've been here in this place beyond time. Long enough that my voice is getting hoarse and my tears are drying on my face. It occurs to me that the waves have calmed somewhat. Suspicious, I sit up to look around, forgetting for a moment that I can't see. But actually, and when did this happen, I can make out the barest edge of the rock the faintest outline of my hand. The air and water still, bit by little bit. And as they do, I become aware of an eerie, deep and primal vibration across the water through
through the rock and in my bones. The vibrating gets stronger and overtakes the waves, rippling the water according to its own pattern. I am, again, surprised to find I can just make out the closest ripples on the surface of the deep black ocean. But my newfound curiosity vanishes in an instant. The vibration stops all at once. Everything is still and the ensuing silence is absolutely deafening. Squeezing my eyes shut, I curl into myself and cover my ears. It lasts for either a century or a moment. And as quickly as it began, this awful stillness is ruptured by a gust of, gust of scorching wind that burns my lungs with a peppery sting. Finally, the gale subsides and my choking with it. I yell and cry in frustration. I write myself and open my eyes to find before me what I can only describe as a ghost. Sitting before me is a whisper of silvery gray cloud against the black backdrop of this living hell. Physically, she's barely discernible, and yet she is so familiar to me that I'm positive I know what she would look like if she had a body. Hello, she says. I'm so far beyond the realm of any sort of expectation that I just gawk at her. Her presence here, where I have been alone with my fear and anger for a lifetime, is entirely unwelcome. And yet, I get the sense that she couldn't possibly care less whether I wanted her here or not. You're bleeding, I finally say, horrified. She's missing a few fingernails and her palms are shredded. In spite of myself, I reach out to gingerly touch her wounds. I can't be sure, but as I do so, it seems like she gets a little less wispy, a little more solid. She looks a little more like I already know she does. I bleed when you bleed, she says, as if it's a simple matter of fact, as if this were even possible. I look down at my own hands, stiff and sore, and I see that they do look just like hers. Whether I'm numb from cold or fear, I'm not sure. But as I've crawled along this rock, my skin has been ripped apart on my hands, my thighs, my belly, and my breasts. I finally notice what should have been obvious. My clothes came off in the undertow. I'm totally exposed. I look back and forth between the two of us, confused. Her wounds do echo mine, but as I study her, I see there are other etchings across her skin. Underneath the blood, she's covered in scars. From her right eye down her neck, spreading across her chest, and all the way to her left hand, I can just make out the puckered marks of a terrible burn. Entranced, I reach out and stroke the delicate skin, but the instant I make contact, the same vast area across my own body explodes in a blistering pain. I immediately pull my hand back. What the hell was that, I ask, gulping in air as the pain fades to a loud throb. Listen, she says, and reaches for my hand. I pull back before she can touch me. Whatever that was, I never want to feel it again. Reading my mind, she says, you felt it before, you can do it again. I want to say I don't know what she's talking about, but just a flicker of a memory stops me. Not a thought with words to it, just a small knowing. She holds my hand over her skin, hovering, not touching. I feel the heat radiating from her scar. She gently touches my fingertips to her neck. Listen, she says again. I suck in my breath in searing pain while she holds my hand ever so lightly to her translucent skin. I don't hear anything, I tell her. There doesn't have to be any sound for it to be telling you something. What do you feel? My chest tightens and my stomach starts to boil. I feel hot and itchy between my fingers and behind my knees. I want to run away, and I also feel like hitting her as hard as I can, but I know it wouldn't be hard enough. I am deeply sad. I feel my throat constrict. I feel ashamed, even though I can't quite grasp what for, but that feels really true, the shame, like it's the closest thing to the center of me. I'm also afraid and frantic and lonely, and I can't get enough air. 
A long time after I can't take it anymore, the emotions stirring in me begin to coalesce into language. My heart clenches as I recognize a familiar refrain. She's right. I've touched this nerve many, many times. What do you hear, she asks me, pulling my hand away from her neck, holding it gently. I just look at her and all I can do is cry because there's no way I'm going to say it out loud. She's more substantial now, I notice. I can clearly see the contours of her face and she's crying too. She cries when I cry. My tears come in big shuddering sobs now because I know that she knows and that she's going to make me say it anyway. I am not wanted. She's solid now and I'm relieved because I need to feel the weight of her arms around me as her tears mix with mine. For a long time, we just hold each other. Then I wipe my nose on her shoulder and pull back to look at her. I lightly trace her scars. The burn of believing I'm unwanted has faded to a relentless needling. The rest flare up as I run my hands across them, but I know what they'll say before I touch them, and that seems to lessen the full force of their impact. The knotty line across her full stomach is from calling myself ugly. The gash down her inner thigh from groin to knee is from believing I'll never be good enough. And the deep gash in her side is from telling myself I'll always be alone. Finally, I have to ask the painful question. Did I do this to you? No, no, oh no, she says holding on to me. When I made you, I bound myself to you. I made a lot of beautiful things before you and after you, and they're all meant to remind you of how much I love you. But I know there are a lot of voices that try to drown me out with lies. When you hurt, I hurt. I feel the pain of the lies you believe even long after you've become numb to it. So no, you don't do this to me. I do this with you. As the profound silence stretches before me, in me, and around me, my bones hum with the depth of my own capacity for desire, grief, love, rage, and loss. This great emptiness is suddenly less about the absence of anything than it is about the muchness of myself. The mystery of these waters, my bond with this woman. The very weight of my wanting, fully exposed, is truly quite something. I think I already know the answer, but I ask anyway. Who are you? She looks at me expectantly, if not mischievously, for a moment. Then says, well, who do you say that I am? In the beginning is the word and the word is with God, and the word is God. She is in the beginning with God. All things come into being through her, and without her, not one thing comes into being. What has come into being in her is life, and the life is the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. No, the darkness does not overcome the light of life, from darkness, life is birthed. Like the changing of one season to the next, and from day to night to day, we live in cycles of life and death and life and death and life. The two are not in competition with each other, not ever. And both life and death have much to teach us about ourselves and how we might best love one another. There is no resolution to this story neither as it's written, nor in our lived experience. The reason the divine spirit seems so familiar, why the main character can almost remember what's happening as it unfolds, and the reason her other wounds are not as painful, is that she has been here before. We are not born out of darkness only one time, but come home to it again and again, with the divine spirit meeting us there and inviting us to heal new wounds from old lies, each and every time. 
with grief and love, disappointment and hope, rage and joy, we are stepping into a new year. I promise that this year will bring, bring both death and life to each one of us in any number of ways. And it will be good, and it will be bad. And like all the years we have lived before, and all the years we have left to us, we will co-create it with the Divine Spirit, who has loved us from before the beginning. <laughs>